Today we have uh, what we call a panel discussion. And this panel discussion has been organized by APS as their first panel discussion on gender justice. And this is almost like a kickoff, a kickoff kick um, panel discussion with a theme called Unpacking the Issues Towards Gender Justice in Namibia. All of you should have a folder with you. And in that folder, you will find all the information specifically about the host and also the program. Now, I'm not alone. I put my partner, the sign language interpreter, Selma Moses. And Selma Moses is here with God people coming from, uh, from people with disability community. And they are here to join us and also to participate in this debate. Now, everybody will be asking, what's so different about this panel discussion? I mean, some of you have been heard about gender equality, gender justice, gender, I don't know how many, many, many things about gender. But I think, as I've already mentioned before, we're trying to create a much more broader perspective in the way we want to look at this, at this topic today. Basically, it's not business as usual. And I really want that to be very clear in our head as the way how we're going to approach this. And I've already told you that this is a kick, a kick of kind of dialogue, um, starting a discourse on gender justice from a social perspective in a very healthy, peaceful, constructive, and mutual respect environment. I need to stress that because some of these issues which relate to gender, they can be so volatile, they can be so dangerous, we can actually, if it's possible, start fighting with one another here. And we might not fight physically, but you could just see the way how people are talking, in their mannerism, in, their, in just their body language. But we want to do it with style, we want to do it in a way whereby we can all listen to one another with respect, allow one another to really speak openly without feeling intimidated or without feeling that people will not want to hear what I have to say. Uh, I hope we can, all of us, together create that atmosphere for, for people to feel uh, comfortable to share their views. And as I've been speaking to, to the organizers, they've been saying to me that this is almost like their flagship, meaning this is not only important to them, this is key. And they will also feel that they want to be driving. They feel that this discussion is worth driving and is also worth leading. And this is why we want, they want to do it. So we want to explore issues further because this is not the first time people are talking about gender equality from a social perspective. Uh, we also want to emphasize certain aspects. We want to be moving away from only looking on aspects in a very more kind of a, a symptomatic way, but really trying to dig deeper to the roots so that we can stop complaining, stop lamenting, but basically asking ourselves, how do we move forward? What is it what we can do to, to move the barriers? We really need to be able to move barriers. And having said that, as an overall objective while we are here, we want to look at the outcomes. What is it what we hoping to come out of today with this debate. Now the outcome which I'm going to share with you, they kind of broad and we are not expecting them to probably reach them today. But as I said, today we're starting off and I think we want to find out what is it what we're trying to achieve at the end of the day. We want to maintain a peaceful and respectful public dialogue. As I've said already that this is what we want to cultivate a culture of peaceful and respectful public dialogue. We also want to create an atmosphere which is moving towards addressing gender issues from a broader perspective, building bridges, analyzing of political culture, for example, and really looking at transformational approaches. What is it, what we can talk about, which people can really hold on to as a way of moving forward, as a way of not only change, but really transforming our mindset, the way how we think, the way how we look at issues. And also looking at human rights from the perspective of class system society, because that is also important, and I think that's one aspect to address as we are moving forward with this topic. 
Now, having said that, I would like to invite um, Freya, Freya Hagen. I've said it correctly. Uh, and uh, she is the director of the FIDEC Igasitu, and she is the one hosting us here. And I would like her to come and just introduce and welcome everybody here. Freya. A very good evening to you all. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to the premises of the city of Stiftung here in Sorento. It is wonderful to see you all here. Let me first start by saying a very well, warm welcome to our Honorable Alexia Nova. Nova, please, and also been fine, yes. Our Deputy Minister uh, of the Ministry of Gender Equality, Poverty and Eradication and Social Welfare. Ms. Yvonne Kauquito, Special Advisor to the Ministry. Technical. Okay, then I was briefed wrongly. <laughs> Technical <laughs> Advisor to the Minister of Gender Equality, Poverty Eradication and Social Welfare. Ms. Nilo Gelba, Ms. Angel. Well known activist, feminist, intersectional gender as justice author. It's okay, I could add a whole long other list. Thank you for coming. Mr. Sarathiel Sinipina, affiliate member of Many Gage Media Network. Thank you so much for coming and thank you all so much for coming, making time to be here with us. Just the other day, when I was at it's a reception. You know, I mentioned what we were up to for this evening. And it was a very interesting reaction I received. Um, people said, oh, yeah, sure, gender justice. Mm, gender, yes. So, um, you're going to have another discussion on gender-based violence, I suppose. And I said, no. Gender is not only about gender-based violence. It encompasses a whole lot of things. As Dofi already Claimed quite nicely. It's a broad concept. So, you know, still, you talk about gender and you, what, what is it, what is happening? There are quite um, strong reservations, even defensive reactions. Not only in Namibia, everywhere, everywhere else in Namibia. Um, so, just mention, uh, just listen, I think you've heard that before. Why gender? What, why do we use that? Why, what's the use of it? So much has proved, improved already. Women today are much better off than they used to be in the old days. So, okay. Another one. Ah, all these debates on gender-based violence, they go on and on, and yet the numbers are still rising. Okay. And then the, the third one I like, I like especially. <laughs> ah, you just want to tell us that women are better than men. So. <laughs> These are just one of the reservations you encounter when you talk about gender issues. Yeah, and true. When we look at some numbers, the media does appear to be quite advanced and doing quite well when it comes to the equal representation of women in the public sphere. You all know probably the numbers of our representatives in Parliament. Let me just mention it: 43 percent of seats are really. Um, you know, our female, oh, let me put it back then. <laughs> the Human Development Index even points um, to quite remarkable achievements. Namibia ranges amongst the 20 top countries, actually the 13th. Quite remarkable. When you look at the gender pay gap, that has at least officially decreased from 20% 20 in 2012 to 6% in 2018. And in 2021, Namibia even featured as number one in Africa and as number six both months. So why? Why do we have to continue talking about gen gender justice? Well, all these figures live in multidimensional poverty. You know, the average rate for Namibia is 43%. Then 43% of female headed households report to be employed formally, there we are, 62% of male headed households. So there is clearly a lack of formal employment for women. 
The overall poverty rate for Namibia has been established at 64% by the World Bank recently. There are some research, some studies uh, that indicate that it is especially young female workers with little formal education living in larger urban households that are especially affected by poverty. Of course, unpaid care work in Namibia. The bulk of the burden unquestionably lies in the shoulders of women. And I could go on and go on and go on. So, what Arthur says is we don't have a, you know, a unified picture here, but a multifaceted picture. Whereas women who have enjoyed high level education on average seem to be doing quite well, we have to take into account that for most women and children, in Namibia, the living conditions are very dire still. And again, of course, not only for them. Because if we think of 64% of poverty in Namibia, then obviously that includes a huge chunk of the male population as well. But women and children are at the lower end of the income scale, and they are hit worse. So, women say their reality remains the struggle. That was the title of the Namibian in April 2021, just when the Human Development Report was released. And I think this is true. It is against this background that we are convinced of the need for a more comprehensive approach towards gender justice issues in Namibia. So what is gender, is gender justice? It is an approach that calls for the freedom to choose different ways of being and living based on equal distribution of resources, equal possibilities to exert influence, and equal respect regardless of gender. We could put it a little bit differently. Gender justice calls for intersectionality. That sounds very abstract and academic, but don't be you know, scared of that, because it's very concrete when you look at this more closely. What it does is the following. It calls for the need to draw a multi-dimensional picture of discrimination and poverty in Namibia. Because all these various aspects of discrimination, class or socioeconomic status, age, ethnicity, gender, ability, etc., etc., all of them should be dealt with inclusive in an inclusive and intersecting way. Because only by doing that we can comprehensively address the realities on the ground. In a nutshell, social justice and gender justice are strongly interlinked and they should be dealt with in conjunction, therefore. So, we are not going to have just another TBV debate today, as you already pointed out. No. We rather strive to broaden our focus by touching upon some of its most crucial aspects of gender justice. The impact of toxic masculinities and its effects on the Namibian society as a whole. Identity politics, respectively the perspectives of LGBTQI plus communities on gender is justice, equal access to public goods, and finally, multiple dimensions of gender discrimination affecting people living with disabilities. So let me close with a vote of thanks, first of all, again, to our respective panelists for making time to come to be with us, to all of you for being here, and of course, to the FES team, who did quite some magic today under the overall super vision and coordination of Sylvia to really, you know, come up with this nice ambience. And I think mm -hmm. we will, later on, we will be enjoying that very, very much. So, I hope you're going to have a lively stage. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you engage. And I hope to see you more often here when we continue this company. Thank you very much. To do is not only to welcome us, but to give us just a kind of a perspective. Uh, and uh, it's almost like setting the scene in terms of what is it what we should expect uh, for today. We've got four panelists, and I know that she mentioned their names already in some of the topics we are going to, to be discussing, and also thank already the panelists for being here to share their experience. 
and their expertise. And I would like you just to give you a bit of a sense of how the program has been laid out. What we're going to do is we're going to give each and every panelist 10 minutes to give their input. I was looking at this, at this topic and as you can see, I like the fact that they were selected because they're really looking at various aspects. You know, it's almost coming from a different angle. And I think they, they, they're not like your usual topic when it comes to gender equality or whatever topic you're looking at. So it's, they are very, very interesting and, I'll, and I'm urging you to listen carefully because I already had a talk with Mr. Salatio about this toxic, toxic, toxicity is it toxicity or is it toxic or what is the what is the verb? Toxicity. Toxicity. I was even asking what is the verb of that word. So he's going to talk to us about that, and I would like to call him on the podium so he can take the the mic. First, let me recognize the presence of the deputy minister. Um, and the advisor to the minister, Ms. Nilokewa, uh, um, and Madam Freya, and uh, all the invited guests present here. Yes, my name is Salati Oshinodima. I am the director of an organization called Women's Action for Development. Uh, but today I am here representing a network called Men Engage Namibia, which is a network of uh, organizations that are involved in engaging men, of which our organization is one of them. Toxic masculinity. I don't know why they have to pick me to <laughs> discuss this. We discuss uh, during our engagement with men, um, looking at men from a perspective of how we socialize. Quite interesting topic, and what we have observed uh, is that you will always find that uh, there are men that cannot distinguish between what is natural and what is learned. You will always find that, yeah, men are just like that. I mean, we are like that by nature. But then you really have to go deep into, you know, going back to the influence who we are today. Um, toxic masculinity is, is defined and conceptualized in a cultural and societal as well as historical context. Generally defines the set of physical, psychological, and behavioral uh, characteristics associated with being boys and men. It places a significant importance on manliness based on strength, lack of. When a girl child, when, when your daughter comes to you, she's five year old, four year old, comes to you complaining that she has beaten by another child. What do we always do as parents? What do we do? A daughter. A daughter. A daughter will say, oh, come here, sorry, 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 sorry. But for a boy, what do we do? We never call daughters cowards. But we, we call boys cowards. Are you a coward? You are beaten by another boy and you come to complain. You go back and beat him. Two things involved there. One, we are telling that child that do not express your emotions. And it perpetuates the rape culture. Because you are taught to be dominant, isn't it? If you look at the rape that happens every week when we open newspapers, we read about it. Do we ever sit and question ourselves, where does this come from? Why do men have to behave in this manner? Which school do they go to? 
what do they learn that they should seek or they should get sexual satisfaction by force? And then, mental health. Bottling up of emotions lead to stress, depression, and obviously, suicide. Men are taught they are providers, eh? and if he's unemployed, the burden, the burden on him can lead to depression. We have read in newspapers about the fishermen who lost their jobs. Some of them committed suicide. Why? It's the pressure. I have to provide. As a man, I have to be employed. And toxic masculinity is not only perpetuated by men, it's perpetuated by society as well. That's why society has to really reimage itself. The, the, the president said this is the year of reimage. We need to reimage ourselves. We need to rethink how are we raising our children. Men are not told to solve problems. When you send him back, the only solution that you are giving him is violence. But why don't we train our kids how to solve conflicts without being violent? I think that's what we have to look at, because what kids learn influences how they behave when they are adults. Thank you. All right, thank you. So it's such an honor to be contributing to today's discussions on gender justice. Thank you to First Namibia so for the invitation. And also like to acknowledge that I'm standing on the protocol that was already established. So I believe that <clears throat> when we can, platforms like, like these must frequently be hosted in various communities at various levels to decentralize information, but most importantly, to build collective consciousness on what we aim to achieve with these engagements. So just to reintroduce myself once again, my name is Ndilo Kelwa Ntengwe, it's Malawian for you. <laughs> I'm an intersectional gender justice activist, author, advocate, and recently added CEO to my title after the launch of my tech company earlier November last year. So today is particularly interesting for me because it just dawned on me that for the past two years, I had regarded myself as a gender justice advocate, but had not really fully and authentically unpacked what this meant in principle, in definition, and in practice. So I feel that as long as I keep protesting or advocating for equal inclusion of women, of gender and sex minorities, then I must be a gender justice advocate. But for today, the first time through this presentation, through this platform, I am actually defining it for myself and truly internalizing from my own personal preparations. So what then is gender justice? I think I'll just give a brief context um, to level the, 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 the comprehension. So according to Women for Global Fund, the term gender justice best signifies our intersectional approach that centers the diverse needs, experiences, and leadership of people most impacted by discrimination opportunities, and equality, which looks into equal outcomes for all. Now, for me, the takeaway from this definition is really intersectionality. And the key word for me here is intersectionality that is underpinned by the ideology of intersectionalism. As a self-identifying lesbian, I will frame a perspective which may be deeply anecdotal and personal, but also draws from the two years' worth of experience working with organizations, with movements, stakeholders, and right holders to truly arrive at an answer or a truth of what gender justice looks like within the parameters of tonight's discussions. They play a role in the way that gender justice is attained. So let's give some contextual examples. If I am a transgender farm owner, what enabling policies exist to ensure that my gender does not become a barrier, but a marker for inclusion in the many ways that it has already been marginalized and affects my growth as a farm owner? 
This means that in politics also, Parliament should represent my needs and interests. In technology and in innovation, my ideas must be. My health is often compromised because of discrimination, multi levels of discrimination. How can I, as a transgender farm owner, be productive enough to contribute to the development of the economy? There are countless examples and narratives to present, but I'm truly here to emphasize our lens for inclusion and equality to reach a level of intersectionality that produces, perhaps even manifests, this gender justice we ought to realize in the future, but should be religiously engaging presently. It's not about only putting yourself in someone else's shoes to understand, to understand the perspectives of someone or the perspectives of the LGBTQ plus community, but instead, the goal, it is the standard. I thank you. Thank you. Face that division, and also my fellow panelists. Uh, thank you very much for having the office of the executive director here at this discussion. Uh, I am Yvonne Kaupetu, and I'm the technical advisor to the Honorable Minister of uh, Honorable Doreen Sioka. Now, uh, I will be speaking to equal access to social protection as a public good. Now, equal access to social protection is one of the welfare goals that countries around the world seek to achieve, and definitely Namibia is not an exception. Um, especially uh, in the, the face of uh, many uh, uh, problems, uh, economic downturns, your, your um, 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 uh, excuse me, natural disasters, and also issues of pandemics and so on, we cannot run away of, for having social protection as a welfare goal. Now, we can no longer view social protection as a favor, but rather as a fundamental human right for all that gov which government should confer on all its citizens. Now, especially uh, coming from the at the international level where the provision of social protection is enshrined, for example, dating back to 1948 in the Universal Declaration for Human Rights, especially Article 25 and 26, where there is a provision for every human being should have the right to, basic, uh, to a basic standard of living adequate for the health and the well-being of him or herself, but also his family. This will include, uh, not exhaustive, but uh, food, clothing, housing, medical care, social services, and also right to security. Uh, also at the international level, the International Labor Organization Convention 102 of 1952, and also its uh, subsequent recommendation 202 of 2012, uh, making provision for uh, social protection flaws for each member state, uh, for example, to ensure social protection flaws uh, for the citizens. Now, at uh, the level of Namibia, of course, the, uh, the Namibian constitution uh, does provide, uh, especially or it uh, exhorts the state to safeguard the dignity of people, of all the people, create equal opportunities for women, uh, protect children, support the unemployed and indigent, ensure decent work and provide regular pensions for the elderly. Now, it's also through the Article 95, definitely safeguarding the well-being of all Namibians, where the enactment of different laws and policies, non-discriminatory, so whether these are policies looking at education, looking at health, uh, looking at uh, environmental sustainability, uh, social welfare, and so on, uh, they should not discriminate, and it should, they should be geared towards uh, the well-being of all Namibians. Uh, um, now the government, uh, definitely we, the government of Namibia continues to strive towards the provision of equal access to social protection through a range of instruments. You know, there are definitely policies, instruments, and programs out there, but once uh, the information is not getting to the people, uh, then uh, there, there, there is a problem there. So there, there, there is definitely a range of instruments, such as information policies, uh, where we run public awareness campaigns to inform the citizenry what is 
uh, uh, available for, to, to them in terms of social protection. The fiscal policies uh, such as subsidies on consumer goods and social assistance transfer, regulatory policies such as safety at work regulations and min minimum wage and public provision such as government schools, your public health uh, schemes and housing and sanitation. These are the range of in instruments that are there where government is trying to program. It's really specifically at the Ministry of Gender Equality, uh, Poverty Eradication and Social Welfare where we administer a number of cash transfers. And it's really when you're speaking of social protection, you are trying to address or the the aim is to the aim is to, uh, to address uh, or the main purpose is to address risk and vulnerabilities uh, across the life cycle, so from cradle uh, to grave. So as a result, today you might not be vulnerable, but tomorrow you might be. So that's why it is very imp it is imperative to have social protection as a public good that is not exclusive, uh, and you 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 just. Um, um, you don't compete with anyone, it's your right and it should be conferred to you because you don't know when in life you will uh, find yourself in uh, the state of vulnerability. So the, the, the ministry administers the, the uh, cash transfers to uh, the, the, the programs of government. There's also, uh, of course, child uh, grants, child protection grants, or OVCs, uh, uh, orphans, vulnerable, uh, and, uh, orphans and vulnerable children. Uh, they all, the, the, the grant is also in existence. There are also some uh, uh, range of in-kind assistance, uh, your income generating activities, food assistance programs, uh, especially to uh, the school feeding programs, of course, that we, we run together with the Ministry of Basic Education and so on. Uh, of course, you have social care services, especially for children, children shelter, spaces of safety, residential care, and also community uh, early childhood development centers and uh, children's social services. We also have community-based uh, programs for marginalized communities. So these are the range of instruments in which especially the ministry is trying to uh, uh, ensure that each and every Namibian uh, during your life cycle, if you fall into vulnerability, at least uh, you are uh, protected through the social protection system. In as much as Namibia is uh, regarded as having a very comprehensive social uh, protection system, we know that still there, there are uh, exclusions and so on. So that's why the, the, the social protection policy uh, is uh, aiming to address those social ex exclusions uh, because uh, uh, definitely it should be a right, and if it is a right, then everyone should have access to it, and that's why it is indeed a public good. Now, social protection is also key, uh, uh, especially in Namibia, it has played a, a crucial role in reducing and alleviating poverty. Uh, the implementation, the way uh, reports, okay, reports are widely uh, documented that uh, these programs, especially the direct cash transfers, having uh, reduced poverty in Namibia, um, and uh, statistics uh, like uh, in 1993, between 1993 and uh, 20, 1993, 94, 20, 20, between 1993, 94, and 2015, 2016, we uh, managed to reduce poverty rates from 59.3% to 17%. How we have responded as government to that uh, from the office of, of the president, also from our ministry, uh, because if we are now standing at 64%, in as, well, in as much as we realize that there were many uh, um, sectors that must have derailed or, or might have reversed uh, the, the way we have dealt with poverty, um, one really to go from 60, uh, from 17 to 64, almost back uh, the, the years just before, um, just after independence, then uh, you really have to question, especially the formula that we are using. And one uh, thing that one also has to look at is how clearly the national statistics uh, as compared to, of course, global statistics, which ones do we speak to? Um, so we, we really have to, to go down and analyze uh, what type of formulas and methodologies that are being used because 
Already now, uh, when he uh, came on to power, His Excellency, remember, he increased the pension grant almost 50% or 100% because it came from 600, currently standing at what, 1,350. And the fact that we know there are empirical or significant uh, or empirical evidence that uh, direct cash transfers indeed uh, reduce poverty. So where do we feature this in? Because once we run the survey now that is coming from NSA, the household, and household income and expenditure survey, definitely uh, this intervention must have put a, a dent into the poverty rates of Namibia. So uh, that's why definitely we have denounced the 64%. We know definitely that we definitely we might not send it to 17 where we were, but to reverse to the poverty rate to 64%, really, uh, that, that we will remain to also do our own analysis. And so and this very important uh, panel discussion to share my experiences and other other people with disabilities experiences as we are uh, sharing together and so on. And also to speak on this um, perspective on manifestation of multiple forms of discrimination against persons with disabilities. I'm so delighted for the fact that I'm actually a fan of all issues of social exclusion. And I'm really happy that I have to speak to this topic today. Uh, multi, uh, Multiple discrimination is a, is a discrimination against the person on the basis of more or one ground. A black woman, for instance, with disability experiences discrimination on the ground of her disability, her race, and her gender. Consideration of this phenomenon and its implications for equality legislation is a necessary purpose proposition of implications for equality legislation is necessary uh, uh, to, to be enacted so that all these discriminations can be kept out of our country. Clearly, people are multidimensional and so cannot be classified according to their single characteristics. Each of us has a gender, sexuality, age, ethnicity, and so on. And no one aspect of our identity is necessarily more important than all the others. For many women with disabilities, their most punishing disability is the attitude taken to them by the society. However, it is a heartbreaking when you speak to people with disabilities and hear about their experiences. Three well-educated and working adults with disabilities reporting discrimination on a daily basis. For example, people calling you names and staring at a person with albinism working with someone of the opposite sex. This person felt as if he is not allowed to love or to be loved. When a person with albinism has a child, which um, seen as maybe black or not having albinism, people are even questioning whatever is really happening. Why is the child looking like that? And why is the mother looking like that? And this really caused pain. A qualified hearing impaired teacher reported that whenever he turned up at offices and people hear he is a civil servant, they automatically take it for granted and and and, and, and think he is employed as a cleaner or as a janitor. Such people think these are the only positions people with hearing impairments can be employed for. The hearing impaired person said he feels he must be as twice as good as the person without hearing impairment to get the same position in an organization. So why would you think this person is less person because they are hearing impaired? 
He said that persons with without disability, so-called without disability, do not have fully understand understanding of, of, of the needs of persons with disabilities. Even in programs meant to support persons with disabilities, people think that they are not capable of handling their own issues. He also mentioned that adults with hearing impairments are not allowed in positions at boarding school since their disability might pose danger to the children in their boarding school. Some teachers are, are, are understanding, but others not. And they will always question you like, why are you late? Why, why are you from uh, Tengwe here that uh, some people don't recognize the rights of people from the LGBTQ plus? Some children are cruel. They also don't understand that others can copy the rest from them, uh, not in the examination, but get me wrong, but the rest after the teacher has put down things on the board. Director um, of the proceedings, stereotyping is a big problem. Sometimes there is an over, over expectation, such as uh, people with albinism are smart. And, and, and people with disabilities in general are smart people, you know, people are looking at you if you do something and then, oh, you must be brave, you know, those kind of comments. So you are not accepted as an equal in the society. People just assume that you can pass without uh, working hard because you are so smart. And do not appreciate that the fact that you have really worked hard for your achievement. On the other hand, under, <clears throat> under expectation, it's more of the norm. People think you will take double the time to complete tasks given to you or that you are incompetent to do the work. The portrayal that I personally dislike the most, wherever on movies, TVs, or shows, or, or maybe the dramas and so on, the depiction show people with disabilities as being desperately in need and seek help for the charity. The majority of people with disabilities characterize as, uh, as, as people who are sick or charity cases. This means that persons with disabilities are viewed as sick and need to be cured in order to function and even be happy. So my advice to the media particularly, to the media, is to reflect on anything you write about persons with disabilities before publishing it. Ask yourself, what is the message I'm setting out there to the public? Am I helping to promote persons with disabilities as individuals? that can and have achieved much. So my question to journalists and reporters are, did you publish at least one article that is positive regarding people with disabilities, except them crawling and leaving wheelchairs and so on? Some people with disabilities also report they cannot go to places of worship because the moment you come into the church, you became the topic of the day. By the pastor, you have to be prayed, and so on if you refuse, and then you are possessed with demons. So some, some of us are even refusing to go to churches because of that. Even children of persons with disabilities are being discriminated against as they are reminded of their parents with disabilities and challenges. In some household disability grants, are used to buy food while other family members preserve their funds for, for other things and so on that are important. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I don't hope my time is, is now about to finish. Uh, oh, two minutes. Oh, okay. So you don't have uh, reasonable accommodation for a few minutes. <laughs> so, uh, the experiencing discrimination makes participating 
in every day, like, every day night, more difficult. I can and this can affect education and employment opportunities and limit social interaction. Let me just go to the awareness raising. Perhaps how we can uh, address these practices of uh, discriminatory practices. We have to raise awareness. Inform people uh, that are, le are, are less likely to discriminate. Mainstreaming of disability issues in all offices, ministries, and institutions that are in Namibia. We have a national disability plan ourselves, and this plan is a blueprint, in a government blueprint that is advocating for the mainstream. The rule of law, justice, equality, and non discrimination of respect of race, sex, ethnicity, and cultural diversity, and of all equal opportunity permitting the full realization of human potential and contributing to share prosperity. People must understand what is meant with reasonable accommodation for persons with disabilities. Reasonable accommodation means necessary and appropriate modifications and adjustments where needed in a particular case. Due to attention and consideration must be given to the gender aspect of disability and how this serves as a main factor in determining the meaning and implication of disability and its perception by people without disabilities. The statistics on women assume a general status, while statistics for people with disabilities, people with disabilities, by the way, they are not a homogenous group. They are people with different needs. And, and, and as we know that people with disabilities are triple actually discriminated. So they differ from men. They can even, uh, they, they cannot acquire a, 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 a man to marry instead of a, a man who will then easily acquire a, a woman to marry because of their being seen as we have been uh, uh, taught here that they are being seen as providers unlike a woman. So it is important to consult people with disabilities when it comes to issues of disability at an inception so that people with disabilities can be involved. It is important or it is possible to live in a world of no discrimination, but then everybody must make it or have business to create such a world. Allow me to express my sincere gratitude and uh, appreciation to the field of Ebert Kiftu for creating opportunities like these where we can share the realities of our daily life. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I think I just had some short notes from each speaker, starting with Salati. Salati. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I think it was just picking up from from what he in in, in your starting remarks, right? When you spoke about how women are supposed to talk about toxic masculinity and not men. And I think I wanted to just expand on that a little bit to say that men have to speak about it because women are often victimized by it. So it is men that have to dismantle the system of toxic masculinity in order for those conversations to, to really progress and to move forward. And I think also borrowing from your analogy around the boys that are you know, sort of saying to go fight back versus how women are nurtured differently is really that the messaging is different when a man is violent towards a man versus a woman. Uh, the socialization from childhood is that boys have to defend their masculinity and dominance. But for girls, they have to protect them. So if men are violent towards women in adulthood, it's linked to power and not necessarily the way that it's linked to dominance and hierarchy when meeting out violence. So to men, it's linked to hierarchy. And society perpetuates also, as I agree with you, 
the toxic masculinity because we've all internalized it, women, men, and so from a young age, we all do internalize it and, and perpetuate that system. So I think it was just a comment on that. And then I suppose that perhaps in the discussions we will hear more around, you know, with, uh, with Yvonne's, Yvonne's contributions because it's quite interesting how what was said here, the, the, how public goods are a right. And that's a concept that I think I'm just hearing now. And I suppose that we can expand on that a little bit more because if that is the right thing, you know, we see so many children and so many people that do not have access to basic housing, clothing, and and all forms of markers that indicate that their dignity is is regarded. So I suppose we can expand on that a little bit more. And then also, to our Honourable, thank you so much for that contribution, on disabilities. And I think that that really does tie in the lens of intersectionality, right? And how I, as much as possible, and I think maybe also other gender justice acti activists and advocates, you know, aim to include that lens for themselves, as persons with disabilities that are often also excluded from conversations like this. And I think that the minister did touch on race, gender, and the disability that are multiple forms of discrimination. But I wanted to expand on gender too, because what if I am a trans person who is black, living with a disability? And so we look at then all the multiple forms of vulnerability then that one might be experiencing. And so often it's the most visible disability or the most visible vulnerability that is regarded when in fact our lens should be much, much more comprehensive. And that, that comes back to my other point, that people are not classified according to their single characteristics, characteristics but often in the LGBTQ community it's a single characteristic, like their gender or sexual orientation, which is used to determine access and development. And I also do definitely agree with the comments on exceptionalism, around how a person with a disability that performs well in school, you know, there's excess burden and underwhelming burden on, on that specific individual because of, their, uh, because of their disability. And I think that that's something that I, I'm also very much now beginning to comprehend. The other is also around mental health. It was touched on a little bit, but mental health, when we're looking at depression and anxiety, those are other forms that are not visible to us as the physical disability. And those are also the ones that we must also, as much as possible, try to incorporate in our lens of intersectionality. And that includes then, coming back to the honorables, you know, I think, <clears throat> is it scheme for discrimination around race, gender, expanding gender, disability, me mental health also, the one that's often also overlooked. And then also, I just wanted to come in to say that very much I didn't expect discussion here, uh, especially focusing on on on, on the, uh, the deputy minister's uh, uh, statement. Uh, it, it, it all comes down to the recognition of human rights, recognition of an individual and the rights that they are entitled to. And I think that that is a little bit of a, a challenge in our society. Um, how, how we conduct ourselves and how we expect others to conduct themselves towards us is, is what we need to look at. Uh, you know, now that the minister has spoken about the challenges that people living with disabilities. Now that Dilo has spoken about the challenges that the LGBTQ community go through, one really need to internalize it and say, how does my conduct as a human being affect another human being? I think that should be the starting point. Okay, thank you so much. Um, any other comments from the panelists? I think perhaps um, from especially from the toxic masculinity, 
uh, especially when we are dealing with uh, gender-based violence. Uh, it is an eye-opener. And I'm, sure, uh, I'm definitely in a ministry we have a number of programs because sometimes we are viewed as if we are only dealing with uh, women and so on, but we have the various programs where we engage men. Uh, so uh, I think your uh, your input, your uh, you know, especially your, your speech and so on, I, I pick up a lot that we can also take it further in terms of addressing issues, uh, especially the underlying causes of GBV. Now, um, as I was alluding to Article 95 of the Namibian Constitution, where we, the laws and policies are enacted to safeguard the well-being of all Namibians. So uh, we know, uh, uh, of course, Constitution it should be a living document that is open for amendments and so on. So when you were talking about being a transgender um, farmer and so on, I, I was trying to imagine whether we have policies in place, agricultural policies in place and programs that will then exclude you from partaking in uh, any programs uh, in that line. So uh, definitely we, we can pick up discussions around those because uh, we have, as a ministry, we received a lot of, uh, we, we, we engage a lot with the organization, sometimes getting petitions and so on. Uh, but uh, at, uh, at no point have we seen that they are indeed really policies that are, were supposed to safeguard the well-being of all Namibians that are not catering for uh, your, you know, members of your organization. So as we discuss, uh, definitely maybe more information uh, will come to fall. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam Moderator. Um, mine actually is to all the panelists. I just have to congratulate you. Uh, the, 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 the discussion or the presentation was really comprehensive and I have taken something from each one of you. Being the masculinity, the RPQs and, and, and you know, the uh, justice, you know, agenda, justice agenda and so on. So uh, maybe uh, the thing that I could just um, uh, talk to is the issue of the mental health. It's something that you brought up very well, but this one is one of disabilities that is really invisible. And most people think that if somebody is having, and, and we call actually, we have also another term that we say psychosocial disability. You know, when it comes from mental health, when it's, when, it's, when it's having something to do with health, for us, and then it's a disability, until you are integrated in the society, and then we call it a psychosocial disability. So most people, uh, uh, or many people are really, some of them, they, they, feel, they, they feel they are being pushed away of, from the society. And what I see now, they are coming, they start to join the organizations of people with disabilities. The first way is the participation from the ED, representative. Okay, Yvonne? Yes. Mm -hmm. No, I don't have two questions. Because you spoke about statistically. Yeah. You spoke about the report from the World Bank report that says the 64, and then the government has denoted 70%. Mm -hmm. It's it not very recent. The two differences, if you think, in a very limited way. It looked very different. So I, I just want to, uh, why, why is the government only putting up now when the world report came out? We could have this at our citizens, at our exposers. Mm. Why now the government have came out after this report uh, have been published? Okay. That's, that's maybe, mm -hmm. even if the public document as the local or the Namibian citizen, we could have it already and then we integrate uh, Okay. And we have our personal analysis. Thank you. And then secondly, only two of them, yes. it's, it's also a follow up question. Okay. The, the monitoring and evaluation towards this before the, the, the world judge us differently. Mm -hmm. Are there any mechanisms uh, like the, the way proposal like the big uh, attainable, measurable uh, program of I am very applaud to be the other one, the old age, the disability, and even I also have to give the credit. 
Lady Song, rest in peace, the Honorable Katuti, Kaula, who spoke about the patient increase. Because I'm from the grandfather, grown up, child, still a student, and I know the Honorable Bob. So, about uh, in regard to the measures, social grants, the, the person that are not in that category, they the ones like students, unemployed, and the graduate. Are there no other ways of introducing this as, a, as an objective? Okay. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, you. My name is Sharon uh, Hebola. And uh, um, somebody also mentioned something about the teachers and also something that came straight to one issue. So I thought it was like, what the rules in teachers do in terms of doing so that they feel like what is because you, you see many instances where all the disciples of Jesus were made, and wherever Jesus would travel, he would travel to me. So you see, I think churches are bigger organizations when it comes to listening people. So how do we change the, the perception of churches that they make people believe that the husband should be the top, the husband should be the one who thinks, because Jesus is all those disciples were made, so meaning a woman has no right to say anything on the table. So I think if we can cater for the churches, I think we, we can make this cry that you are crying for hungry. Thank you. Okay, next question is going to be granted. I... Greeting everyone. My name is Beata Armas. I'm a deaf person, and I'm also a chairman of the Deaf Association. Thank you so much to our panelists that we have been. Great presentation that we have. I think we have learned a thing or two. Thank you to FES um, for inviting us to the deaf community. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Shinedima. There are a lot of times, of course, women, men perhaps abuse uh, women in their house, in house, in, you know, in families or in their or in, in, in houses. And many times you realize that when you when you investigate further. Perhaps the couple that is married, and sometimes the men, maybe the woman will respect the man, or the men will respect the woman, and then you find that they will clean for them, they will wash for them. But then, when, when if, it's, if it's a man that is doing it, cleaning for the house, or washing for the woman, then the community have a tendency of saying this other vulgar word that um, the man is not so masculine enough. I don't know how to put it in a. Uh, so now, many times they look at, at the woman who's, at the man who's doing it as not men enough. <laughs> yeah. So now, when the women, the, the, the couple together have, have agreed that no, we are sharing roles and we are sharing responsibilities, but in society that is looking at them and judging them in a way that perhaps later on will cause violence, that's my first point. The second point will then be I wanted to ask Madam Kaupet. No, our honourable minister, I think your speech was relate, we correlate to what, what you have said. That's what we are experiencing on a daily basis. And for a long time now, us that are having disabilities are really having uh, more challenges regarding education. We want to be educated, but yeah, we, we are not getting access. And our problems remain uh, the same. They haven't been changing for a number of years now. Do you find people with disabilities that are perhaps wanting to um, to become nurses? But then they will say, no, you have a disability. How, are you, how would you learn or how would you become a, a, a nurse? How would you want to become a nurse if you are living with a disability, if you are having a disability story? So a lot of challenges that we are experiencing uh, in education. So we want to study to become nurses or to, be, or to become doctors. We are told, no, you can't because of your disability. And even in, in employment, when you want to look for, for a job, you enter an office, they look at you, you have a disability, you will never find a, a person with, with a disability in a senior position. Many a times we are given uh, menial jobs. And sometimes we are qualified. We have the skills, we have the experience, but yet we will not get any position that is superior in, in an organogram. So many organizations that are that are that are around our country are actually employing those without disabilities. 
And so we are segregated and we are discriminate, discriminated as well in the, in the employment arena. So we suffer a multiple of uh, discrimination wherever we go. And I'm not sure whether we are able to solve that problem in our lifetime. My final point will be to Madame Yvonne. I swear there's a whole lot of people that are poor in our country. We are saying we are redu 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 reducing or re eliminating poverty. I don't see it happening. Now, for us that are with disabilities, poverty is not an extreme. Many times we apply for tenders. I have not seen a person with disability who have won or have been awarded a tender. Never in my lifetime. I not, I'm yet to see that. When it comes to Agribank, for example, I also have not yet seen someone who has applied or who has been given um, a, a plot or a farm as a person with, with disability. I'm yet to see it. I haven't seen any that are, that are doing farming successfully. So where are we from a person with disability? When you ask now, when you see us around, I would like to ask. Because many a times we are trying to be at the same level or to, uh, as those without disabilities, but we are having so many hindrances, so many barriers in education. We are, we are, we are, we are, we are having barriers in information. We are having no access in workplace where those don't get employment. And many a times you find that people that are refusing to actually pay a service of an interpreter. So many a times when I go for a job interview, I must pay an interpreter myself. And my pension or my social grant does not really allow, you know, for me to, to be able to do that. So now many a times government is saying there's no poverty in our country, but there's a lot of informal settlements in our country. Every day you see someone trying to erect a check. Is that not poverty? How are we reducing poverty? Water is now expensive, electricity has gone up, everything is up, <laughs> everything is very exorbitant. But that's where I am. Okay, Yo, you guys have said. Well, before I move on this side. Yes, I would like to respond to her question. You know, um, this, is, this is exactly part of what we are talking about. Toxic masculinity. You see, when, when we do presentation to men, I give them, uh, 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 you know, like a picture of where we are coming from, for them to understand where we are. Because the cultural practices that she's talking about, or social, were developed by people that came before us. And I always say there are three things that you have to take into consideration. You have to look at the environment that you are in, the circumstances, and the needs at that particular time. Now, I always ask this question to men, that you see, in 1400, our forefathers, they lived in a forest, in a jungle, right? And they distributed labor between men and women in a certain manner, where maybe they said, let's, say, let's assume, they said, men, because you are muscular, you go and hunt for meat so that we survive. Women, you stay at home. That's how, that's how their environment was designed. But today, uh, in 2022, you know, when I go out of my house in the morning to go to work, my partner also go out to go to work. That is like going out for hunting. And nobody complains about that, that she should stay at home, she should not go and work. When we come back, she does all the household chores. While I'm watching TV, reading newspapers, we have new, new societal practices that we have adopted. I don't know who distributed these, these practices, but that's the reality. And, and what we always try to encourage men is that we should understand the environment that we live in and the needs, understand our needs, current needs, and then respond to those needs. If it means I have to wash the kids while she's cooking, let me do that. If I have to clean the house while she's, let me help her. That does not make you less of a man. That's one thing that we have to understand. It does not, sometimes I will, I will ask, how many men here change nappies? And you have some men, even elderly men, that raise hands. And I ask, does, did that make you less of a man? No. Yes, okay, mine is just really on the, the disability part. 
I think it's, it's also quite unfair to tell, a, to tell a person with a disability that they cannot become a doctor or a lawyer or a nurse. Also because we have so many examples of people living with disabilities who are doctors, who are lawyers, who are nurses, who occupy various different professions. So therefore the onus should not be on the person with a disability to prove they can excel despite their, their disability or that they cannot because of their disability. The onus should be on institutions, on government, in private sector, everywhere, to upgrade infrastructure, to invest in infrastructure, so that they are included and enabled to perform to become doctors, to become lawyers. The environment is the, is the enabling factor. And I always live by this, by this formula. Accessible environment plus disability equals inclusion. And that is something that I think that we must also begin to embody to, to begin to start internalizing really to what extent are we including persons with disabilities in the environment as we are sitting here? Is the infrastructure here, is it accessible? Because once it's accessible, you immediately sort of remove that burden of their disability to make the environment include, inclusive. Mm. Okay. Yes, Yvonne? Um, uh, thank you so much. Um, fellow Namibian citizen, um, I'm, I'm actually having the very same question that why are we so obsessed about the outcome of the World Bank report while we have been having our own survey done by the NSA and as you will recall in his inaugural uh, State of the Nation address, His Excellency alluded uh, to the, the poverty rate in the country. So I don't know, maybe uh, somehow I can agree that perhaps the information does not get to everyone. Uh, definitely we should uh, um, improve on that so that we get the information. The reports are there at NSA. I don't know how they are uh, disseminated, how they are distributed, but these are public documents that everyone should have access to. And indeed, uh, these are well documented in terms of the reduction in poverty. Um, now, uh, of course, uh, the basic, uh, your basic uh, necessities like water, sanitation, we have all these problems. You know, definitely we have money circulating in the economy in as much as it is little. This should actually be able to also help the economy uh, to recover. So. Um, there are all these really uh, uh, basic uh, necessity or, or programs that are aimed at the provision of basic necessities, but as a result, definitely there are so many factors. Mm. Even us inheriting uh, a very unequal uh, uh, economy and so on, so all these factors are playing a role. So where we can, we are starting somewhere, and indeed, uh, uh, my fellow Namibians, the, there are uh, 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 evidence that we have reduced poverty to that 17%. And as you will recall, it's excellent. So I think even if we reduce it to 5%, it's still not, uh, uh, because the thing is, when you are talking 5%, it could be 200,000 people. And those 200,000 people, uh, if I am one of them, I wouldn't want to hear that we have reduced poverty. So as a result, the national statistics are saying Namibians uh, is around 300,000, less than 400,000 Namibians living in abject poverty or below the lower uh, bound poverty line. That's where we are standing and we are going, the surveys, uh, the, the income and expenditure survey is taking place next year and then we will have our new national uh, statistics, whether they will be closer to the 64% or less and so on. That we remain to see. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There was a question of the church. I don't know how much Mr. Shinedima has touched on that, because there was a question of that in the olden days the the disciples were uh, men, and how we can change that perception of the church. I think really I want to leave that to you, and it will be interesting to hear what should be the perception of of the church. And then the issue of the disability, uh, discrimination, and uh, in terms of employment and education and so on, I think uh, uh, Dilo touched it very well, and I thank you very much for that uh, receptiveness, can I say. 
and 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 then um, perhaps what I could really just touch on is the the, the indirect discrimination. You know, uh, Ms. Arma Siata has spoken about even resettlement and, and people with disabilities to be uh, um, resettled or having farms or maybe getting to Agribank to get uh, um, funds then to do your loans to start their own uh, farming businesses and so on. Uh, uh, that is indeed true because and, and this is for me, it, it amounts to uh, 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 indirect or say direct discrimination because the policy is very clear on resettlement whereby people with disabilities have to be affirmed and they must be given priority even in, when it comes to resettlement. But this is not the case. Uh, they are always being sidelines whenever they are applying for, for resettlement, which means for me, that is a, a direct discrimination, deliberate discrimination, ignoring the policy and then do whatever people want to do. Okay. From my side, I should just uh, first of all appreciate really having a platform like that. Me being a woman as well, since people when they think of gender, they think of women first. But overall, when uh, we look at the uh, the Constitution of the Republic of Namibia, for instance, gender is no longer something that people should be worried about, but it's something that should start from early childhood development until the sectoral approach where we have whether gender for a person or different policies that are very accommodative and so forth. Now, when we talk of all different programs that the ministry is implementing, and uh, all other things. How are we making sure that there is no discrimination clause? I know it was addressed for the issue of different programs, but are they all accessible from all corners of Namibia? Let me say from Kunene to Zambezi, just as equal as they are accessible in Bindu, for instance. And uh, the issue of welfare as a social uh, responsibility for government as opposed to the fundamental human rights. Uh, when it comes to welfare issues and human rights, where are we drawing the boundaries? How can we hold as citizens the government accountable when it comes to issues of social welfare and social justice? And how accessible is justice in Namibia if a person like my sister they feel very infringed or discriminated? Are we aware of different tools that are available to protect or reinforce that? Since Article 10 has made it very clear. I think that's my contribution. Thank you so much. First, first a side comment. I think, uh, Mrs. Yvonne, in 2015, uh, the president had said uh, at his uh, inaugural um, 2015, he said that no, as a government, he wants to be rated by international organizations, international international uh, bodies, and not uh, by locals. So it's funny when, when the international body rates you that high, and then still the same government still says that, oh, no, ah, I don't want that rating. I want the local one. So just, it's just a side note. But please just uh, just take note. <laughs> Secondly, yeah. Uh, the question goes to the first question goes to Tundilo. I'm not sure if you have read it, but um, I, but I think you might have. It's, it's an issue around the, the new rape act in terms of justice, because because in, in gender justice, like the lady said, gender is not only about women first, but it's all but it, it's, but it's about equality and inclusion. Now the rape act makes provision for for an accuser, I mean a victim, to go and report a case and. Uh, and then immediately the police comes to my house, and then I'm thrown into the in the party, then I'm taken to prison or to jail, for, for instance. Now the issue comes. Now there might issue comes in about uh, false, accus false accusations, because uh, I'm a victim as well, and also a few friends of mine have been victims of, of such, where they have been on social media being uh, accused of rape, false accused of rape, uh, GPV, and so forth. 
But the state just says, ah, no, it's fine, my brother, go home, uh, go and have coffee. So my question comes in, then how do you ensure that equality also happens to the victim, or to, or to, the, yeah, to the victim in terms of being falsely accused of, of such? The second is the, is the issue around uh, acceptance, tolerance, and inclusion. We, we live in a country where I think we tolerate the LGBTQ community. I think we tolerate them. We, we tolerate them. Oh, they are there. It's okay. But then the issue comes also of acceptance and inclusion now. Because if, for us to include them in the, in the, to include into discussion means that we need to accept them. Well, we need to accept them that, that they are there, first of all, as a human being. First of, first of all, as a human being, accept them as, as who they are and also, to, to also for them to, to, start, to, to start participating. Because I feel that we, we, we don't, we're not at the, at the level of acceptance. Because once you, once you accept them, then you'll also be able to allow them to, to include them, meaning, meaning now participate. Mm. So my question is that now, where are we? Because I feel like, I feel like we're just tolerating, you just say, ah, it's fine. But then in terms of, in terms of the inclusion, mm. are we, in, in your, I read your book, but in your, in your advocacy, do you think that we have in, accepted and, and, uh, and by way accepted also including, um, the LGBTI community to participate in various in various platforms. Okay, so uh, my name is Ngashi, I'm a, a sociologist from UNAM. Uh, I think my question, well, it's not really a question, or maybe it is, uh, gender justice. I think there has been a lot of issues that we raised here. Uh, and, and I want to just mention something in relation to what uh, George had mentioned. When we speak of gender justice, and I think we need to understand it also in our everyday uh, um, um, experiences, our everyday lives. And I want to use an example of the, also relating to what the uh, um, uh, Madame from the uh, saying, our national statistics, currently, they, they, I think the NSA has been collecting data. Yeah? And this collection of data that they are doing, um, that, that form that they have, because it's thing of gender justice and inclusion and access and, and, and accepting sex versus gender on that form that you are completing. So let's really speak about it, sex versus gender. So for example, somebody who, from, let's say from any of the LGBTIQ community, how do they, how do they sort of like, defi not define, but what, what, how do they That's identify, right. identify mm -hmm. or even categorize themselves, even when it comes to the completion of that uh, census or survey? Most of them, they will opt not to respond, and therefore they are excluded from the statistics that we are talking about. Gender justice, let's look at that. When we're speaking of gender justice, um, the, the lady that was uh, speaking earlier today, she raised a whole lot of issues, even to go for a job interview. And the question is even to this panelist, uh, you know, again, where, as, as individuals, what role are we playing in our respective uh, uh, corners? For me, as I stand here for you as you sit there, so gender justice is not just about us looking at issues like gender roles like what were some of the questions that are raised. It's not just about gender roles. It goes beyond gender roles. It's not just about some of the social norms. Well, it goes beyond the social norms of who's supposed to do what, who's supposed to do what. And maybe we need to also start looking at some of these issues. So when we speak of gender justice, the, when the Ministry of, uh, I mean, when the Ministry of uh, Poverty, no, not Ministry, this, the Ministry of um, Gender, Yes, that ministry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Depending on the informal economy in Namibia. So when they talk about gender, the informal economy is having uh, the majority of the women because they have uh, excluded from the industry as from the culture of the past to get this idea. But what we see, or what we see, 
is that a, you know, I mean, if you talk about a street hogger, for instance, that person take a loan from a family member or from a bank or from ever, you think a, uh, a, a potato box there or something. But at the end of the day, these things are being uh, uh, taken away from these people. So now, this is not discrimination. And we are talking about, in the informal economy in Namibia, we're talking about between 300 to 400,000 people. So, but discrimination is continuing, but no ministry or no whatever the police is evicting these people. So see, there is no action which is being taken. And we are talking about social protection. And we are talking about poverty reduction. Those who are helping themselves, we are taking their things. But those who don't help themselves, instead they will be protected through social protection. What kind of, you know, okay. what, what is that which mm -hmm. we, are, we are trying to do? Okay, thank you so much. Go ahead. Okay, um, good evening. Um, my question is about the comments that were raised about uh, Honorable Deputy Minister, uh, Mr. Ngidima and Ms. Yvonne, and they mentioned a common issue, and that is the issue of society. So now, there's a saying that goes that the perception of uh, the perception of reality is more real than reality itself. So the perception that the society has in with regards to gender and disability is very important. So whatever solution we make at the top is ineffective if it does not reach the society. The Honor Honor Ms. Yvonne was speaking about about the issue of policies. There are awesome policies that are being created. But if this information is not properly dispensated to the ordinary members of society, the ordinary members of society cannot make use of the information or cannot be changed by it, by the so, supposed information. So my question is, how does the institutions, the local institution, the government and the media work together to groom the members of society, to change the perception in the society so that they can be able to be emancipated? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, my, okay. Name, my name is Roy Pope, by the way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, one here and then, and then, yes, you are the last person on this side, and then I'm done with this side for now, okay? Hello, hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Rivaldo Gurira. Um, I have an issue that I want to address about equal access to social protection, protection as a public good. Okay, uh, I came from a, from a community that is, in base, that is based in Kadetura, and our youth organization is actually fighting this part. The thing that I want to say is we have lack of education, we have lack of opportunities, we have lack of resources and plus we have lack of information. Plus the government only gives the information to, to those who have formal information and those that uh, is unemployed has nothing else or, or information to know about the base of gender-based violence that acquires in the community or the society or the grants that has to be uh, to given to the, to the youth. Because the youth is the future generation of the country. Plus nobody focuses on the youth. Wow. Okay, Nobody. your question, please, can you be short? Nobody focuses on the youth, so I just wanted to say that let the government focus on the youth and okay. focus on those that is unemployed. Okay, thank you so much. Let the government focus on the youth and those who are unemployed. Yeah, good evening, everyone. My name is Gates. Um, I was in my Senate. Yeah, um, firstly, I would like to thank the panel. Uh, it's a lovely discussion uh, on this. Um, Mr. Shinediva, I want to start with you um, on a friend note. Uh, let's encourage, encourage men to name or to give friendly names to their kids. Because sometimes the person name is child Shikatana. You know, it's, it's very tender. It's, very, it's like a panga or something. You, you need to discourage that. Uh, because it doesn't look good. Yeah, we can go on. Uh, the, the, the second one goes to Dilo. Uh, Dilo, uh, when it comes to LGBTIQ in our community, the, the, the very first challenging aspect in that regard is the definition, which is quite missing. Uh, even in our laws or policies that we are uh, formulating, we, we need to go away with 1964 law. It doesn't hold water. And this is up to the young generation, upcoming young generation, to advocate for this law to fall. Yes, yes. Yeah? Yes. 1965, 1960, it doesn't make any sense. 
Uh, lastly, our gatekeepers, especially the traditional authorities, the, 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 the church leaders, when it comes to the, the panel or platforms of this of this type, we, we need really to capacitate our gatekeepers. Even people, they are very lucky because we have access. We are, not, we are talking about access, affordability, and uh, what is the other word? Um, and availability of information. So basically, my my, my point is um, to to make sure that, like, let, let's say you go to Rund or Zambezi region, a person, for, for goodness sake, the only document the person had to access whatever social services that are there, the person only have a voting card. It, it, who gives who give the authority for counselor? People are missing out on social benefits. And, and this is a serious one. And the last point is, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, what is this protection order? What do you call it? Pro uh, protection order for people who are seeking justice within that process. Protection order is useless. It's not. It's not working. We need. We need to simplify the form. We need to make people understand. In fact, we need to decentralize and ensure that people understand the basic information before they access social justice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you give to the panelists to respond to those questions? So now we're going to come to this side and I'm going to give you all an opportunity to ask those who are going to ask. But let us give the opportunity to the panelists if there's any. Um, you don't need to start if anybody wants to go first. There's an outstanding question of the church. Yeah, um, look, I don't think when. Jesus had 12 <laughs> disciples. The idea was to discriminate against him. I don't know if it's written anywhere in the Bible, and I don't want us to have that assumption. That the 12 disciples were male because women were not good enough, or he could not find women that are. Because whatever reason, you know, why he had he chose male disciples is not given. I don't know if it's given in the Bible. Maybe let's not assume now, you know, and try to find some some solution to that. Because I think it's also not in our place. But I always say that look, we can we can, you know, cite what happened in the past. But let's talk to what we are living now. Let's talk to our own environment. Let's talk to our own needs. What are our needs? What, 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 what does our environment and circumstances say? What do we have to do? The gentleman is talking about 1966, so 1928 laws. Are they relevant today? Why were they, initially, we have to, to, to answer a question. What was the purpose of bringing this into law? Does it relate to our current environment? What are the contents of that law? Do they relate to our current environment and needs? And I think only from there, then we will be able to understand what we need to have for ourselves. OK. I also want our panelists to be short and sweet when you answer. I've got many people waiting to ask you more questions. Okay, I will try because I think there were many bullets shot in my way. Um, I think to start off with the, the 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 questions around the false accusations on rape. So I think that this would be my my response, right? And I think that we can definitely also discuss further offline because I think it would take up so much more time. But I do believe that in a society like Namibia where we have prevalent rape culture, which is entrenched, which is pervasive, you find that there are very, very rare accusations on false, false accusations of rape. And even if you're looking at the statistics according to the National Plan of Gender-Based Violence, 
around the perpetrators of SGBV, 93% of those perpetrators are male. So I then would like to employ, they occur so frequently, these rare, very rare false accusations, then I, I think that persons that who have been falsely accused must then together, you know, find the solutions on how to address this. But again, coming back to really on how very rare these cases are. And I think also on reputation, I, I agree, a reputation I think would be a separate part, that various mechanisms can be established, but it's so rare that false accusations occur. Also, I also do agree to, to do disagree to some extent that men lose their reputation because of the social power which men hold and occupy in society already. Men still continue to occupy positions of power, you know, they are emboldened by their friends, by their colleagues, by their family, and by their comrades also. So even the ones who have not been falsely accused, the majority of them, that is, the perpetrators, are still occupying various different positions of toxic masculinity here. But when we read about headlines of men that have been sexually violated, what do the men do? How do they respond to that? Often they are laughed at, there's a lot of mockery. In fact, they embolden the men even further. They make a mockery of it. So I think that the conversations around false accusations must not occur in isolations of the victims of men who have been violated to also then look at the community that they are, that they are, that, 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 that they're surrounded by to begin to dismantle once again those toxic masculinities to address those false accusations that are very rare once again and also the ways that you you address the, the, the violations that men themselves experience. On the LGBTQ plus community, around issues and acceptance and, and inclusion. So definitely on a societal level, as you pointed out, there is levels of inclusion. And I think even myself having to speak, you know, at that podium talking about my self-identifying self marker is another milestone to talk about the levels of social inclusion as opposed to other countries like Uganda where you know you might also be stoned to death. But now coming back to the other levels of inclusion, which includes our, our law and legislation, you know we're still sitting on a hate speech bill that must still be tabled. We are looking at the Combating of Domestic Violence Act last year. They excluded the protections of LGBTQ plus persons which means that their cases are treated separately and less severely than, you know, someone that has been victimized by SGBV. The Combating of Rape Act is one of the most comprehensive that we have in the country. And definitely there is an expansion there that they are building on. And then the other, I think, linking to, to your questions around the laws and how outdated they are. You know, we are talking about obsolete laws currently that are tabled in which they must be abolished because they do not serve their purpose. And under that is also the sodomy law, which was reported by the, by the Law and Reform and Development Commission. And, and yeah, by the Namibia Law and Reform Development Commission. And this was submitted last year to say that this specific 1977 Act 51 is outdated as well, because it, un it also falls under the, the, the obsolete laws. And if I can just give some context, this law actually says that this that um, persons that are found guilty of sodomy, which means, you know, men having sexual intercourse and sexual, you know, um, activities with other men are regarded as the same as, uh, it's a sexual one, it's a sexual one, uh, sexual offense, schedule one offense, yes, sorry. And you can be linked to the same as murderers and, and thieves, it's the same kind of, you know, crime that, is, that they are saying. And then also they say that because it's a, sexual, a schedule one offense, a police officer or a private citizen can arrest a person without a warrant and use deadly force against such a suspect in the process of effecting an arrest. So these are the kinds of laws that we are currently dealing with that you are going to be reading in the newspapers in the coming months. We are talking about, you know, obsolete laws, laws that were inherited by colonial institutions, by apartheid. I don't even want to get to the abortion one. So... I think that is my take on, on, on really the LGBT plus inclusion and then also the, the rape. Okay, thank you. Uh, quickly, Yvonne. Um, thank you very much. I, I think the direct one was uh, where do we draw the line between um, uh, social welfare and fundamental human rights. 
I think there are very basic uh, uh, needs. So for example, your right to education, your right to clean water, you know, housing and so on. Uh, of course, I wouldn't say that uh, everyone has access to that, but definitely these are the, 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 the right um, uh, opportunities, uh, equal opportunities, and there should be equal access to, uh, to the basic um, uh, social needs. And then when you come to social welfare, of course, since we have not as yet obtained the universality to most of it, but we are looking at the vulnerable of society, and uh, when you look at, for example, our pension uh, grant is universal uh, and so on. So definitely moving towards that. But in Namibia right now, you should have a right to education and, all, and also as coupled with a free education and so on, which is, of course, now um, a topic of uh, huge debate. But indeed, um, our basic education is free. Um, I have taken note of uh, uh, the issue of youth. Uh, that to, uh, attention need, needs to be paid to the youth. Definitely the programs are there. If the youth, why would you think that the ministry is there? So try, we, we also from outside, and this is where we are saying, you know, we need to meet each other halfway here. If there is a ministry of youth, what are the programs? And especially now with the, uh, the new, uh, the NTP5 and also the upcoming one, the focus is on youth and uh, youth unemployment. Uh, we have also taken note of the issue of national documents. Uh, we are working very closely with Home Affairs, and uh, uh, we have really again strived in this and the issue of statelessness, where we're trying. Definitely, there is an, uh, um, a barrier if you have, if you don't have the national documents, you can't partake in the, the social uh, protection uh, uh, services or social assistance services of government. So uh, we have uh, systems in place. Uh, but definitely, uh, I agree that more information uh, needs to go out there so that the people are aware of, uh, even at the ministerial level, we really, the minister has been preaching uh, as to uh, us to, 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 to get the information to the public. Uh, my, com uh, my comrade, sorry, my fellow citizen there, uh, I, I only co um, uh, quoted what I heard from the speech of His Excellency that I have in, in my possession. Uh, I wouldn't uh, talk about the other one of the national statistics and so on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, my is just brief uh, on the issue of accessibility that was mentioned and the laws that are in the country maybe to protect people with disabilities. There are, we have a UN convention on the rights of this persons with disabilities. This is a very important law that Namibia has. It's an international law that Namibia has ratified. So um, what I will ask is the, the Namibians as a whole to take that holistic approach and, and, and bring in and mainstream disabilities in your own programs wherever you are. Because disability is a cross-cutting issue just like gender. Uh, so we all have to take disability in our programs and not take it as an issue of one phase, which is now the phase or faces of people with disabilities or the ministry that deals with issues of disability. All of us have to embrace issues of disability and, and, and work on it and make our and make our environment accessible to all. Thank you. Okay. Social protection to improve gender equality because um, some of the reasons why uh, we experience so much uh, gender-based violence in Namibia is because women are materially dependent on men. And But you rather use this platform as propaganda for government and also to refute the statistics of the World Bank. And then you're wondering about why people are fixated on, on talking about the 1.6 million uh, um, um, statistics from the World Bank, and you are planning on implementing a basic income grant, which will only be for 46,000 people, which is very exclusive. Uh, and um, you know, we we're talking about you using that as starting somewhere, but it's 32 years after independence, so we are still starting somewhere. You know, if we keep on uh, disputing facts and not want to recognize the problems that we have, which just means that we are not ready to solve it. Thank you. Okay. That's from the statistics, the 1.6.
So um, my question is, what is the ministry trying uh, to do uh, to actually reduce this number of 1.6 million of people living in poverty? And don't you think that the basic income grant would actually be a good um, be, be a good approach to actually reducing this number? Because because it's talking about the uh, high unemployment rate, youth unemployment rate. Imagine if every Namibia would get five hundred dollars from the age of nineteen to fifty-nine. Don't you think that that would actually create employment through as as, as the, the pilot project in Oshibara or might come up with a bakery? And don't you think that um youth uh, would actually uh, start up their own business using these five hundred dollars? Or and as I have seen uh, the the letter from the office of the president, is this what we are actually demanding? Is this what we are demanding? We are not demanding that um. Are about 45,000 people should be given basic income grant. No! Every Namibian from the age of 90 to 59 should be given. Why not? I mean, we have resources. We have resources in our country. That's all why. So why don't you just call it your resources? It's our Namibian. And thank you. My name is Chloe Fureza. And I'm going to be short with two questions. From a policy perspective, what has been done to address the manifestation of discrimination against vulnerable com communities, particularly women as class with disabilities. And my second question is, what would be done by government civil society in other stakeholders, in other stakeholders about this problem? So okay. Thank you. Okay. 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 Men and women benefiting from social protection. And my other question is, how can gender justice be achieved through social protection as a public good? And my other uh, question is not a question. I would like to uh, bring this uh, gender uh, uh, disabilities in churches. Uh, it is this what we don't have in churches like something like this. There are people who just want to come and hear the word of God. Like minister has said that when people like this come to church, we look for manifestations of demons, thinking that they are uh, possessed and stuff like that. So uh, my question as a whole, we just have to encourage and bring this into our churches. Yes, good evening. I'll be brief. Question one. I just want to know which institution in Namibia is responsible for gender justice? Or where can one report gender injustice in Namibia? The second question goes to Mr. Saratiel. Do we have a concept called toxic feminicity? If it exists, what are your thoughts? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I just want to ask one question, um, and that's to Yvonne. That the important thing is uh, we have experienced the grade 10 gap where many of our youth have been put on the street, and no plan has been developed to cater for them. Today, in today's life, they have still not find themselves. Then we have experienced the great fallout of teenage pregnancy. I heard you say there are good programs in the youth and we must meet each other halfway. I really still need to see what the programs that are there because it's very selective and I haven't really feel it in the country, on the ground, in the villages, how it really benefits majority of the young people, but then the teenage pregnancy has been given their statistics. What is in plan for them? Then now, this fallout of the young people now, recently, those who have not made it, they are now sitting. So we have this whole big gap. And maybe if the basic income grant is given to them, that may help us and improve their lives. So what is it that is in store now that we have seen the results? We have failed the great tens about a few years ago. We are failing the teenage pregnancy young girls now, including their babies, and now we are sitting with this result. 
So what is going to happen? Okay, people, there is a great... My name is Isaac Kasume. I just wanted to draw... I just want to look at... Uh, um, I just want to give a, a recommendation, especially to the organizers. Uh, I have observed um, the, the, that you have invited people from the disability and you had the translator. But I was very curious uh, to find out how do they... Um, how is their language uh, compatible with issues like the LGBTI, particularly? How do you translate to a deaf person or a deaf, uh, uh, about, uh, when you talk about a person who is a hemophagite? Someone, uh, majority of time, um, when we talk about LGBTI person, we think about as a person, uh, I mean, for example, a gay person is a, okay, an LGBTI person is a person who is, um, um, uh, this is quite difficult to explain yeah, this. Yeah, thing, no, yeah. no, no. So let's just give me a moment. Um, how do you need a hemophagite person? A person who doesn't have a, whatever, a or he has both of them. Because I have been sitting there and I have been observing how these translators are trying to translate and some of these uh, it appears to me they are <laughs> promoting more stigma, frowning and all these kind of things. My other thing uh, that I wanted to compliment Mr. Chinodima is about the, a question that he, uh, he asked about Irrespective of all the people that we have talked about, the LGBTI, the persons born with disability, the vulnerable, and whoever they are, is how we behave and how we and how society treats us. Okay. Uh, um, Mr. Shinedima, if you could uh, respond to that, because to us LGBTI, I, I also identify myself as LGBTI, I'm a gay man, and uh, um, Stigma, it doesn't, um, you know, let me just leave it there. Yeah, okay. So my question is, um, are these programs also going to have effect with their men out there suffering, being victims of stigma? Or what are they mainly focusing on? Okay, thank you so much. All right. Uh, oh, okay, you can ask a question. You said you've got a question. Yeah, I have, okay. a, I have a question. Thank you so much. I, I think how I want to, my name is Franz, how I want to structure my, my question. Uh, Mr. Saracha, we made a point. I think maybe we need a different orientation. The manner in which we are approaching this conversation is taking us backwards. Our social order of our grandfather, our grandmother, it was that time when those idea of being a man in the household was relevant in their setup. It, it has its particular moment and relevance at that time. But I also understand the discussion that the effect has cascaded to people. But I do understand that what we need, perhaps, to seriously question, if that man, if that guy, think beating, insulting a girlfriend is an answer, that there's a particular inadequacy in such a person. And if in society, the only point we see is toxic, if, if, if we only throw a rebel to that kind of particular behavior, we are not solving these things. We need to cascade, understand people's behavior. And I think labeling whatever, it, it will not take us the conversation anyway. I think let's, let's try to scale this conversation in understanding why people do what they do. Do, do you feel happy when you beat somebody? What does it do to you? If you don't ask that question, you just let them as it is. I tell you, this conversation will remain as it is. 
So we, we must honestly, when somebody exhibits this behavior of being feeling this status of possession, we must critically evaluate and analyze, perhaps help that brother, because he is not able to help himself. What he holds on is the power to abuse or to violate as a remedy for whatever inadequacy he has. I think, colleagues, this is how I want us to frame the conversation. Okay. I, I think the, the terminology, we use it for people to understand. Because if you don't use the terminology of toxic and masculinity, uh, a person will not understand that what the, 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 that behavior is harmful. Uh, we, we, we don't want to promote it. I, I, you know, as you were talking, I wish you would be part of the workshops that we have with men, the engagement that we have with men. Because we go back and we try to identify, as you are saying, and, to, and, and try to come to where we are, as you are saying. And we ask questions. Uh, I, I, I think, and, and at the end of that, particular topic, we then ask, how will we define positive masculinity? And we let the men themselves say positive masculinity will be defined as such and such and such. Um, there was a question on whether there's toxic uh, feminism. Yes, there is. As much as you have toxic masculinity, you do have toxic feminism. And you only get to get that once you engage with men and understand what they go through. You know, we, we have a topic where we discuss men as perpetrators of violence and where we discuss men as victims of violence. And the things you hear that's where you will see that we do have an element of toxic feminism in our society. I'll give an example. A man will tell you, we were once in the location, having this engagement. A man will tell you that, look, I am living with my partner. And we are here in Bindu, living in a Kabashu. Now, I as a man am the provider. She does not work. So when I work, I bring all my earnings to her so that she takes care of the household. And from that money that I give her, at home, she's building a brick house while we are living in a Kabashu. And I am making that sacrifice for us to be going on. And at the end of that, when she knows that she has completed her project, then she will tell me it's over. Hello? <laughs> so we, we need, you see, let's not have this gender bias kind of conversation. Yes, the topic was toxic masculinity. It came up also in our discussions. And we had women saying that we should also talk about toxic feminism. Because they also want to know, they themselves, how they are harmful to men. And these are the engagement we are now talking about trying to merge, you know, this dialogue, so that we have both men and women sitting in one room. Because the, the challenge that we had in the past is that when you have a mixed kind of workshop, you will only have a lot of women and maybe three or four men. That's why we thought, let's, let's just have a dialogue that is designed for men only. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Some questions you want to answer and some few closing remarks. Okay, thank you. So, I think just responding to terminology first, I think that terminology must then be adopted in the various national languages that we have. And I think the other guy made a very strong point around how also the, the sort of like sign language also includes, you know, the terminology of sexual gender and sex minorities so that the, I guess, the vocabulary is much richer and you become more inclu inclusive in your 
in your speech, I, I guess. So, so many don't understand the terminology. I know there was also someone that brought up the definitions of sexual gender and sex minorities. What does it mean? What does LGBTQI mean? And the other gentleman did also get it wrong by calling persons who identify as intersex as hermaphrodites, because that is a derogatory term. So I think it's really just to implore everyone to go and to do some research a little bit. Just go to the Legal Assistance Center. Their website has all the information there around terminology, anyone. And then also coming to toxic femininity, I have to disagree. Because toxic femininity cannot exist because it is not emboldened or entrenched in a system. Toxic masculinity is emboldened by patriarchy, by, mis by misogyny. So toxic masculinity can be internalized, as we've already touched on in the beginning, that society does perpetuate tex toxic masculinity because we've internalized it. The example that was made here by buildings of women disregarding the hard work of men, this and that, that it's not good enough and that, that is also internalized toxic masculinity or misogyny. And so, which is, which is perpetuated not only by men, but by everyone in society. And also, where would toxic femininity be entrenched? It's the same as racism. It has been entrenched and institutionalized. But you don't have reverse racism. You only have internalized racism. Because, again, these systems of oppression, as we've spoken about, the multidimensional systems, the intersectionality, they have been entrenched. So what would embolden then toxic femininity? And how do you unpack that? What would you say in your definition is that? Because later on you discover that it's actually a perpetuation of the toxic institutions, the masculinity, the misogyny that has been internalized. So I think that, again, just the research that must, again, follow these conversations, even within men engaged, because we are also talking about internalized homophobia, internalized systems of oppression, internalized, you know, oppression against persons with disabilities. Because once again, even a minority person can perpetuate a oppression or a discrimination because our thinking, our language has not been dismantled and unlearned. So I think I just wanted to... With my closing statement, I guess it's really just to implore to go back and reflect around all the many ways that we've internalized institutions of oppression in order for us to then expand our language of inclusion for our societies to grow and become much more healthier. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, um, the, the question on the disability grant that has stopped I will have to follow that up because the disability grant indeed is not universal. You are being assessed and so on. So in terms of you acquiring, uh, I mean, getting a job and they have stopped, then I will take your, your, your details and then I will find out. Uh, perhaps maybe it was stopped on the basis of uh, your employment, but that I have to find out. Social protection uh, to improve uh, gender equality. Uh, the ministry at the ministry level, especially when it comes to uh, the issue of uh, uh, most female girls and so on being dependent on the on the, the male counterparts or partners and so on, that's why they end up being abused and so on. Uh, we strongly advocate, and education normally is actually the enabler. So as a social uh, as service, we advocate, and the ministers, the deputy ministers, they've been advocating for girls to really uh, get to go, go to school, get education, so that they can break this cycle of them being dependent on men. So uh, I think there we play a, really an advocacy role. Um, uh, the, the other thing is, um, and our social protection policies, definitely we approach them with a gender uh, a lens, uh, where we know very well that female, uh, females are dispro disproportionately so affected by most of catastrophic events, and definitely when we uh, this, the, the, the social protection policies are designed in that way, at the end of the day, even when you would identify beneficiaries, you will find that most of them, especially even our current uh, food assistance program, most of the, the participants or the beneficiaries are female uh, because of uh, the, the impact of most of these social uh, problems on female, especially headed households. 
uh, indeed, uh, I am glad that you are acknowledging that government has, it, uh, has proposed a grant system for, the, uh, for Namibians between the age of uh, 18 and 59. That is the proposal of government is in the social protection and policy, and we will implement it as soon as resources uh, become available. Uh, I mean, I, I cannot speak on uh, if I'm not available resources, but the proposal is there. As soon as we can get resources together, we will roll that out. Um, the uh, inclusion of men, or, or we want to have them on board, uh, so we meet especially on our cluster, uh, clusters, agenda clusters meetings. We all also have a specific one for, for men where we want to also hear their their views and to you know for them also to for us to understand especially the issue of mental health and so on and all these uh, uh, you know that they are not able to to complain and so on so we we sit around with them especially on the gender uh, clusters. Maybe uh, finally, the ministry, uh, we are open, we have an open door policy. Uh, and I know Namibians sometimes you will ask, where is the gender equality ministry? People will say, no, that long name, I don't know where it is. We are along Independence Avenue, the Twin Towers there. We are open, uh, really, if, we, if there are any information to be shared and so on. But normally we are on the website, all our policies, all, all the plans and so on, they are on the website but we do have an open uh, door policy. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Ms. Mm -hmm. Honorable? Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, let me just start with the young men there. Just, uh, I, I just want to say you are young and vibrant. So what I would like you to do is really to come on board and start to advocate for disability issues and the disability rights. And that is what we want. We want everybody to come on board. And, and, and as I said in the beginning, disability is cross-cutting. It's not a face of one person because we have a disability. It, it's very good that you, uh, you have mentioned, and, and I see that you have an interest on these issues. So please come on board and start to work with us. Yes. Uh, and so maybe to conclude, I would just like to say that um, I'm very happy with the audience tonight. The people have been very receptive in terms of terminology. And I think Namibia is coming there in terms of, of, of knowing what is the right terminology, in terms of when you refer to people with disabilities. In Namibia, we have only one term, and it's people with disabilities or persons with disabilities. We first the emphasis is on a person before you come to the disability. disability is last because the disability doesn't live within the person, the disability lives within the environment and the attitude of the community. Mm -hmm. If we can just take upon ourselves and change the attitude in our communities against people with disabilities and embrace the diversity that are there in our societies. Thank you very much. Thank you. The fact that all of you are still sitting here. It's a true indication that there is a interest in the topic, and people really want to speak out and air their views on this important topic, which really affects many of our lives. Now, we are not claiming that we have answered all your questions, neither are we claiming that we have answered all your questions satisfactorily, but this is the starting point. And we are just so grateful that we are able to gather at the round table and to really address these issues in a mature manner and in a way where we can tolerate different views and perspective so that we can move forward. I think some of the people have been talking about that. When we talk about these things, we want to be moving forward. We do not want to be crying about a problem and a problem and a problem again. We really want to see people coming to say, look, this is the situation I've been experiencing. This is the situation I've been hearing over and over and over again. And in my perspective, I feel this has to be done. We need to be people who can think forward. People coming up with suggestions. Cut people coming up with solutions. Cut people coming with direction. And this is what I want to implore you, that uh, there will be more dialogue. And most of you we have, not most of you, all of you, we've got your details. 
and we would like you to come so that you can really come to a place where you can learn, where you can be exposed, where you are able to even challenge your, your intellect, where you can come up with solutions and really guide the, the debate. This is your debate and you need to guide it. With those few words, I would like to ask Freya to come and close. I know that we have really spent your time, but it is worthwhile. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Well, as you already said, uh, let me first of you commend you. First of you, very uh, you, know, you know, it's late. It's almost nine o'clock, and you're still here. Um, even our panelists. Um, so thank you so so much. Um, but even more so for this engagement. I'm really impressed. I think we have succeeded very very well in, in, in coming up with a lively and yet still respectful debate constructively oriented. Of course, I mean, you will not be able to solve everything, to sort everything out, there will be differences, and this is just an invitation to continue dialogue. And this is what we are up to. So really, you did a tremendous job. And, well, also due to Dopi. Thank you so much, Dopi. You did a tremendous job. You really guided us very well, too. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, well, well. And I think you also did succeed in a second thing, and that is you learn to know new realities. New, not only new perspectives, actually realities, perceived realities. And again, in a very respectful way. Let's continue doing that by actually walking down. It's a little bit dark, but just trust us. You can go 